You're listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B.L. Purdom. Episode 4, Mother May I. In Episode 3 of Quantum Harry the Podcast, Iron Maiden, I began examining the female archetypes in the Harry Potter books, the Maiden, Mother, and Crone. This time, the spotlight falls on the archetype of the mother. Many mother goddesses were worshipped in ancient Greece. The goddess Demeter, Persephone's mother, mourns her daughter going to Hades and causes all vegetation to die. Zeus's consort Hera watches over women in labor. Add the mother goddesses Rhea and Gaia, which is a word often used now for Mother Earth, are quite ancient. Each of these goddesses are known as the Great Mother. The spirit of the Great Mother also rules over the third book in the Harry Potter series, which is permeated by this archetype from beginning to end. Hermione Granger is almost always depicted in the Harry Potter books as a motherly person. The one near exception is in Deathly Hallows, just after she and Ron return from the Chamber of Secrets with a supply of basilisk fangs for destroying horcruxes. When she and Ron reenact Harry and Ginny's coming of age in the Chamber, they are enjoying their own little side story, in which they are a maiden and a youth, rather than a mother and a wise old man. However, because Hermione kisses Ron in response to his concern over the safety of the house elves, who are a bit like her children, her role as an archetypal mother is still emphasized here. Hermione first appears in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone while she's helping Neville Longbottom search for his toad on the Hogwarts Express, almost as if she and Neville are pursuing a lost child. She immediately starts to order Ron and Harry around, like a little mother, telling them to change their clothes to get ready for their arrival in Hogsmeade. Besides these somewhat domestic activities that we first see Hermione engaged in, archetypal mothers are linked to Project Fruition and Completion, guidance in life decisions, nurturing and birth, choosing a mate, and very importantly for the third book, justice, which is something that fits perfectly with Hermione's social activism, first in trying to get Buckbeak acquitted in the third book, and later in regard to her attempts to free the house elves. Hermione is the driving force in Harry getting his schoolwork done, which is project fruition and completion, preparing for the Triwizard Tournament, starting Dumbledore's army, and she's present at the birth of Norbert the Norwegian Ridgeback, Hagrid's beloved baby dragon. In Order of the Phoenix, she guides Harry in life decisions, particularly in regard to Cho Chang, which fits with the archetypal mother being linked to choosing a mate or companion. We also learn in the sixth book that advice she gave to Ginny would be credited with Harry noticing Ginny and finally realizing his feelings for her. Penelope Clearwater is another archetypal mother and Hermione's doppelganger. They share many similarities. Penelope is in Ravenclaw, and Hermione is a near Ravenclaw, something that we learn much later. They both have dark hair, Penelope's being described as curly, and Hermione's as bushy. In the second book, they're petrified by the basilisk at the same time. They're both prefects when they're in their fifth years, and Hermione's pragmatism means that despite being a stickler for rules most of the time, she's willing to break rules if there is a compelling reason, while Penelope, a prefect who is supposed to enforce school rules, like Percy, is also not averse to breaking rules, since she definitely breaks rules in order to sneak around in the dungeons to meet with Percy in the second book, which we know because Harry and Ron catch her leaving the dungeons when they're pretending to be Crabbe and Goyle, and Ginny actually catches Percy and Penelope together kissing. Both Hermione and Penelope have Greek names, and Penelope specifically is the name of the wife of Odysseus. In Greek mythology, Penelope is a mother figure engaging in the archetypal motherly activity of weaving while she waits for her husband to return from the Trojan War. Since it takes her husband ten years to get back from the war, a number of potential suitors are understandably skeptical about this ever happening at all. These suitors become a bit like permanent unwelcome house guests in the house of Odysseus, the king of Ithaca. His queen, Penelope, stays faithful to her husband, even though, as far as she knows, he's dead. She put off the suitors by saying that she would choose someone after she finally finished weaving a cloak that would serve as a burial garment for her father-in-law, Laertes. She worked weaving this cloak for three years, but she unraveled her work each night. In Deathly Hallows, Hermione even claims to be Penelope Clearwater when catchers apprehend her, Harry, and Ron after Harry triggers the taboo by saying Voldemort's name. Harry gave the name of one of his doppelgangers to Stan Shunpike in the third book when he said that he was Neville Longbottom, and Rowling has Hermione choose to go by her doppelganger's name in the seventh. In 
Narcissa Black Malfoy, who is the archetypal mother in the trio of the Black Sisters, will do anything to protect her son Draco, and she generally only appears in the books when she is with her son or doing something to help him, which is the entire scope of her character. When Harry insults her, Draco is as incensed as Harry and the twins are when Draco insults their mothers. In Deathly Hallows, when she's concerned for Draco, she asks Harry about him, and she even goes so far as to lie to Voldemort about Harry's being dead. Her first concern is for her son. Being a mother trumps everything else for her. Harry has many archetypal mothers in his life, Hermione being the most prominent. Joseph Campbell identifies many mother types, and whether it's intentional or unintentional, J.K. Rowling seems to have been determined to include them all in her seven book series. Campbell mentions more of what we would probably consider to be bad mothers than good ones. There's the absent, unattainable mother, who we can see as Lily, even though she has an excellent alibi for being absent. There's the hampering, forbidding mother, a very good description for Petunia, who tries to stop Harry from simply being himself. The repressive mother is the best way to describe Dolores Umbridge, and the desired but forbidden mother, represented famously in Greek mythology by the mother of Oedipus, Yocasta, is Cho Chang. Harry's good archetypal mothers are Hermione, Molly Weasley, and Hagrid, even though Hagrid isn't female. They care for Harry, they feed him, and they knit, like Lachesis, the archetypal mother in the trio of the fates. Molly Weasley knits Weasley jumpers, Hermione knits hats for her virtual children, the house elves, and Hagrid is seen knitting when he takes Harry to Diagon Alley in the first book, as well as many other times later in the series. Hagrid mothers creatures other than Harry as well. He even calls himself Norbert the Norwegian Ridgeback's mummy, with no trace of irony. But Hagrid's first moment as a mother figure to Harry comes right at the beginning of the first book, when he delivers baby Harry to number four Privet Drive. Throughout the series, Harry has repeated rebirths, moments when he either survives something that ought to have killed him, like Voldemort putting the killing curse on him as a baby, or moments of symbolic death and rebirth when he crosses a threshold from one world into another, especially if this crossing involves traversing a body of water, which symbolizes the waters of the womb. Harry does this twice with Hagrid, an archetypal mother, in the first book of the series. To bring Harry to Surrey from Godric's Hollow, which we learn in Deathly Hallows is in the West Country, Hagrid flies with him over Bristol, which means they go over water, Bristol Channel. This is the womb water threshold that Harry crosses when he goes from living in the wizarding world with his parents, and in a part of the country that is home to a great many wizarding families, including the Dumbledores, Weasleys, and Hagrid himself, to living with his muggle relatives in Surrey, outside London. Hagrid also does this using Sirius Black's flying motorcycle, so the fact that Harry's godfather contributed the means of transportation further marks this trip as a symbolic baptism, which is when godparents are appointed, and therefore a rebirth. Later, when Harry comes to Hogwarts for the first time, he crosses a body of water with Hagrid again, but this time he isn't the only one going through a symbolic death and rebirth by crossing the womb waters of the lake. All Hogwarts students, when they are first years, must undergo this symbolic step to leave the world of their childhoods and enter the magical world of Hogwarts. It doesn't matter if a first year grew up in a wizarding household or not, everyone must cross the lake with Hagrid, the archetypal mother, in this act of symbolic rebirth as they begin a new chapter in their lives. When it comes to archetypes, gender is ultimately as irrelevant as chronological age. Hagrid's actions are what make him an archetypal mother. In Order of the Phoenix, the fifth book, Lily and Hermione both champion the underdog. We see Lily defending Snape in A Memory in Snape's Ponceve, and we see Hermione defending house elves. Dolores Umbridge, on the other hand, targets those who are most vulnerable. She and Hermione are contrasted with each other constantly throughout the fifth book. If Umbridge tries to discourage Harry from doing something, Hermione encourages him to do it. Professor Umbridge doesn't want Harry to learn defense, but Hermione helps him to start Dumbledore's army. Umbridge doesn't want Harry to talk about Voldemort, while Hermione sets up an interview for him to speak about nothing but Voldemort. Dolores Umbridge doesn't want Harry to mature. Her detentions are like a repressive parent, punishing a child for masturbation. Writing, which is a healthy activity, is perverted into a painful, unnatural torture. 
She also bans Harry from Quidditch, locking up his broom, thereby symbolically emasculating him, taking his battle rank and removing his ability to threaten the establishment, since Quidditch is metaphorical war, something I'll be talking about a great deal in the episodes after the ones addressing the seven archetypes ruling each of the seven books in the series. Finally, Umbridge tries to keep Harry and all of the students from maturing magically by dumbing down her lessons so that the students will be, literally and metaphorically, unarmed. She wants to keep Harry as a little boy in every possible way, unable to fight his battles, real or metaphorical. When she attempts to expel him from Hogwarts, she's going even further. His return to Surrey each year is a symbolic return to the womb for Harry, before he is reborn each September by re-entering the wizarding world. She wants, in effect, to enforce a permanent return to the womb of Surrey for him. In other words, she's trying to metaphorically abort Harry. In episode one, The Kid's Table, I talked about the unifying theme running throughout the seven-book Harry Potter series, childhood and the things connected to childhood, and the fact that the entire series can be summed up by the words David and Goliath. Umbridge is one of Harry's Goliaths. She disregards children and anything connected to childhood, and in Harry's case, She's even trying to prevent his no longer being a child and growing up. Throughout the fifth book, she is a repressive mother not just to Harry, but to all of the students of Hogwarts, treating even the older students like small children who cannot and should not learn the sort of magic that she and Fudge fears could make them a threat to the Ministry. She introduces one dictum after another to clamp down on the students, to treat them as far younger than eleven, the Hogwarts entry age, and in the face of this extreme repression and denial of the value and abilities of young people, Harry, Ron, Hermione, and the other students in the DA have no choice but to become rebels. Boys at the age of fifteen, which Harry is in the fifth book, often do rebel against their mothers, and Harry especially rebels against Umbridge, the repressive mother. He doesn't rebel as much against Hermione, but he does balk at her orders more in the fifth book than he did previously, and more than he does later in the series. Hermione doesn't always cope well with his rebellion, especially in sixth-year potions. Slughorn evokes Harry's mother when he praises him for his potions prowess during Half-Blood Prince. He thinks that Harry's abilities are inherited from Lily. Campbell's desired but forbidden mother is Cho Chang. She's an older girl who is initially with Cedric Diggory, who's also older than Harry, and who is an admired father figure, which will come up in the next episode examining archetypal fathers. When Harry witnesses Cedric's murder, it is, for all intents and purposes, a reenactment of James Potter's murder. Harry accidentally contributing to Cedric's death puts an Oedipal spin on his romance with Cho. That's O-E-D-I-P-A-L, as in Oedipal Complex, the idea that Sigmund Freud promulgated that some men are in love with their mothers and, to pave the way to being with their mothers, those men fantasize about killing their own fathers. This dooms Harry and Cho as a couple from the start. Harry even encounters a sphinx in the maze during the Triwizard Tournament, and he solves the riddle of the sphinx just as Oedipus did. So, a quick recap on the Oedipus story. In Greek mythology, Oedipus killed his father and married his mother after his father heard a prophecy telling him that this would happen. So his father sends the baby away to die, but instead he's found and raised by foster parents. Which means, of course, that Oedipus doesn't know who his mother and father are, and that's how he ends up killing his dad and marrying his mom. After turning Harry down for the Yule Ball in the fourth book, Cho takes all of the initiative in their relationship during the fifth book. She talks to him first, and she hints that she wants Harry to take her out for Valentine's Day, as well as setting the stage for their kiss in the Room of Requirement after a meeting of Dumbledore's army. Cho Chang sees Hermione, another archetypal mother, as competition, and she briefly even takes on Umbridge's role by supporting Marietta, who rats out everyone in Dumbledore's army, after which Cho is very angry with Harry for siding with his other mum, Hermione. Characters who are archetypal mothers let us see Harry nurtured and coddled, fighting repression, maturing and developing into an autonomous adult, and separating in a healthy way from his mother figures as he matures. At the end of the sixth book, especially once he knows more about his actual mother's legacy, he's poised to accomplish this transition to adulthood. The three archetypal mothers who are most important in the third book, Prisoner of Azkaban, are Lily Potter, Hagrid, and Hermione Granger. The way that Lily is one of the most important mothers is a little counterintuitive, however, because what Harry must learn in connection to her in the third book is how to let her go. 
The temptation to hear his mother's voice, which he is unable to remember at any other time, crying out as she grows closer to her death, makes it impossible for Harry to conjure Patronus at first, because he knows that if he does, he'll no longer hear this voice that is so precious to him, a voice that he doesn't consciously remember, but only comes swimming up out of the depths of his unconscious memory when he gets too close to a Dementor. His experience with Dementors is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, he is reliving the worst experience of his life, his parents' murders. And if he doesn't control the Dementors, he could be in danger of receiving the Dementors' kiss. But on the other hand, he's never been able to recall his mother's voice before he encountered Dementors, and it occurs during an experience could mean his virtual death if a real Dementor, rather than a Bogart, sucks his soul from his body. So it's very important that Harry learn to conjure a Patronus, but in order to succeed, he must stop desiring to hear his mother's voice. One of the new lessons that Harry begins to attend in the third book is Care of Magical Creatures, which is taught by Hagrid. Hagrid introduces his students to hippogriffs, creatures that are a combination of a horse and griffin, while a griffin, in turn, is a combination of a lion and an eagle. Harry immediately takes to Buckbeak, the hippogriff he flies on during his first lesson with Hagrid, while Draco Malfoy immediately makes an enemy of Buckbeak, setting in motion the quest for justice pursued by both Hagrid and Hermione, though neither of them succeeds by strictly traditional methods. It's only the use of Hermione's time-turner that ultimately saves Buckbeak from the executioner, and that also saves Sirius Black from the Dementor's kiss. <laughs> The archetypal mothers in the third book, Prisoner of Azkaban, the one who best embodies the book's ruling archetype, the mother, is Hermione Granger. She becomes a literal mother, not just an archetypal one, by adopting Crookshanks, her cat, at the beginning of the book. And Crookshanks becomes friends with Sirius when he's in his dog form, helping him behind the scenes. Just when Hermione takes on responsibility for another life, her cat, she also experiences something a lot of new mothers go through, sleep deprivation. This is because while she's using the time turn to attend lessons that are scheduled simultaneously, she doesn't seem to be using it to get more sleep. If Hermione is using her time turner for, say, three additional hours of lessons per day, but not giving herself more sleeping time, she's effectively living through a 27-hour day each day and becoming progressively more and more sleep deprived since she's only increasing her waking periods. This is likely to be why Hermione shocks everyone by rebelling against Professor Trelawney and storming out of her classroom. She's also apart from Ron and Harry for an extended period of time during this book because of two things. The feud with Ron over whether her pet ate his pet, which is again related to her literal motherhood, and because she turns over Harry's new broom, the firebolt he receives from Sirius, to Professor McGonagall, since she's afraid that it is in fact from Sirius and that it's cursed. So she's only half right about that. This is another instance when she's being like a protective mother toward Harry. And like any kid whose mom is doing something for his own good, he's not always going to be happy about it. Time is a key theme in the third book. Hermione uses a time turner to get to all of her lessons, and she catches on to Remus Lupin being a werewolf, which Harry and Ron do not, perhaps because at this point in her life, she also has a monthly cycle. At the climax of the book, Harry echoes her earlier actions by using the Time Turner, which, like Ginny using Riddle's diary and Dumbledore's efforts to protect the Philosopher's Stone, we didn't get to see firsthand when Hermione used it before the climax of the book. Without stepping into Hermione's shoes and echoing her earlier actions, Harry couldn't have saved Sirius and Buckbeak, and he wouldn't have been in a position to conjure the Patronus that saved him, Hermione, and Sirius from the Dementors. The archetypal mother rules over time because she is ruled by time. However, with the time turner, Hermione manipulates time, that which would control her, and Harry shares this attribute with her at the climax of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, the book ruled by the mother archetype. You've been listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B.L. Purdom. All music heard on Quantum Harry is composed and performed by B.L. Purdom. Next time on Quantum Harry the Podcast, 
Episode 5, Our Father, an examination of the archetype of the father in the Harry Potter series. I hope you'll join me.